The numbers tell the story. PSEG has a positive impact on New Jersey. Every year, hundreds of millions of dollars are paid to 9,100 PSEG employees who live, work, and spend their money in New Jersey. PSEG pays $157 million in retirement and survivor benefits to New Jerseyans, too. And PSEG pays about $375 million a year in New Jersey and local taxes. About 86,000 PSEG shareholders in New Jersey receive over $100 million in PSEG dividends. And PSEG spent $1 billion on New Jersey businesses, keeping it local. And our biggest impact for over 100 years, delivering electricity and natural gas safely and reliably to over 2.5 million New Jerseyans, day in and day out. New hope for patients and families affected by stroke, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Inglewood Hospital and Medical Center, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, and New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, stroke is the third leading cause of death in this country, but new surgical techniques are improving survival rates and the quality of life for stroke patients. Here in the studio to talk more about this important subject, we have Dr. Paul Sapphire, an attending physician in the Department of Neurosurgery at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Roberta Abrams survived a stroke in March of 2011. Jeanette Abinot is a speech-language pathologist at the Adler Aphasia Center. And finally, Lamar Bolden is an occupational therapist at the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation. I want to thank you all for joining us. Make sure you log on to our website throughout this program to get more information about stroke and uh, related subjects. Doctor, let me ask you, define stroke for us. Uh, an acute ischemic stroke essentially is when there's a blockage in a blood vessel within the brain, and that part of the brain is deprived of oxygen, nutrients, and is starved and can die. Uh, it's very similar to, say, a heart attack, but one that's occurring up in the brain. We do call it a brain attack. How common? Uh, it's very common. There's about roughly estimated mm -hmm. every year in the United States about seven to 800,000 people are affected. So it is a very common condition. As you mentioned, it's the third leading cause of death in the United States and it's something that can have a very devastating impact in our society and on the individual level. Doctor, what are some of the causes of stroke? Uh, strokes are usually related to some of the more common conditions that we're all aware of, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart conditions. Um, people that are prone to, to say, having a heart attack are also those that are prone to developing a stroke. Mm. Roberta, it was in March yes. that you had your stroke. And Dr. Sapphire just laid out some of the um, symptoms or some of the causes, if you will. Do you have any sense of what might have caused it? Well, I had a history of um, ablations, which was AFib which is my heart Explain rate. That. My heart rate was too high. Okay. And I've had, uh, had to have a procedure to try and sl slow down and get my heart rate and heart rhythm back. Um, as a result, um, I've been on blood thinner, mm. but there was a blood clot and the blood clot broke off and traveled to my brain. And as a result, I had a stroke. What exactly? happened? Well, initially um, <clears throat> I felt some weakness in my right hand um, and since I was alone I wasn't aware that I couldn't speak but I knew something was wrong and I went to call my husband on the phone and I couldn't speak other than say the word stroke and I was able to call 911 and say stroke and they were at my apartment within minutes um, that was the biggest clue, obviously, was that I couldn't speak. Now, time is absolutely critical, correct? I mean, the amount of time that goes by from when you think you have something going on, could be a stroke, say it is. Time's huge, right? Yes. yes the more time that goes by, doctor, 
what? Every minute that goes by, there are literally potentially millions of cells in the brain that are dying. The, the brain is a very fickle organ and does not tolerate any blockage of the blood vessels to it. And so time is so crucial that um, if anyone is even concerned that they may be having a stroke, just like a heart attack, right. they should dial 911, they should get into an ambulance, they should get to the to okay, So if someone says, Jen, oh, come on, I'm being ridiculous, what are the odds? No, there's, there's, why take that risk? <laughs> Right. And, and, and you listen to Roberta's story. How typical, I mean, if there's such a way to describe a typical story, how common is that experience? I would say that's probably pretty typical. Um, most people are very aware, especially the speech component and, and weakness in your <clears throat> hand, not being able to move, not being able to communicate right. suddenly like that. Yeah, now, I can't now, ignore that. Again, I just want to be clear. You deal with, um, is it fair to say, Lamar, acute situations? Acute, um, but we would see the patients after they've been through the acute um, hospital, which is where Dr. Sapphire would treat them and get them stable, um, a team of neurologists, and then they would come to Kessler because that's when they start to begin the recovery process. Describe that. So um, we receive patients from the hospital and uh, we would evaluate them, a team of therapists, a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, myself, a physical therapist, um, our phys physiatrists who work there, um, there's a whole team of people, and basically, we're looking at their level of function. How are they going to be able to get back to the life that they had before? Do um, most of them? To some degree, yes. Um, you may not always be able to do everything that you used to do. A really big struggle right now in terms of stroke recovery is um, people recovering to the point where they can go back to work. Um, because stroke patients are now so much younger, a lot of people are, and, and people are working longer. Oh, hold on. Back, back up. Stroke patients are younger? Well, younger than what probably my mother's generation would consider a stroke patient. Hold, they uh, why, why is that? Uh, well, there actually has been a rise in the younger population of stroke. Probably some of it has to do with dietary changes. Uh, for There's been a rise in w younger women who are having strokes, probably because of oral contraceptives and things like that. Because of oral contraceptives? There's been a linkage between the two. And it's not an insignificant linkage, actually. I wouldn't say it's one of the most common causes, but I do think that we have seen a rise in that population, in that subpopulation, I should say. But it's also, I think, important to, um, for everyone to know that it, there are no boundaries. It crosses all ages, all right. walks of life, um, mm -hmm. all sets of circumstances. You're saying so. virtually anyone is susceptible. Yeah, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. so if someone were saying, hey, listen, wow, I, I didn't realize it was so prevalent, and Obviously, Roberta, you know, it's, it's only, it's March and you're obviously doing well. And you told us before we got on the air that the most progress you've actually made in your recovery since you had the stroke has been in the last month. Yes, I'm at the highest level. Um, over the last six months, uh, it's like a breakthrough. Um, my speech was always at a um, high level, um, but at this point, there's much more, and, and there are nuances um, from a stroke that over the first couple of months, I didn't realize the damage initially. And over time, I realized, well, there's other damage other than just speech. Like? Um, difficulty in pl places where there's high volume. Um, being Noise. Noise. Having delay process of a conversation where there's more than two people because I, I, it takes me a little bit longer to process what's being said to me. Well, stay on that. Okay, stay Doing on this that. Program, stay on that for a second. Okay. And I want you to help me on this. I was curious in, in reading the notes to get ready for the show, I thought, it's challenging for anyone to come on public broadcasting or any network to do a talk show. Did you feel any pressure in, or tension or anxiety, whatever, in connection with doing this? Well, it's quiet in here, so that's part of it. Uh, the other thing is I'm very comfortable with Dr. Sapphire, and I've, um, I, I know the entire process of Adler, um, Kessler, so I was comfortable with that, and I've seen you. So, that, that, <laughs> and that, in spite of that, and you still of that, agreed that, to do the show. Um, <laughs> But there's, there is, it, it's different than being um, on the phone. And you're holding up a phone, and it's immediate, immediate response. 
I found to adjustment that because of delay process, holding my phone in front of me on the speaker. And that very, very short period of time from year to year gives me enough time to respond. So you do make some adjustments to those nuanced changes. Amazing. Uh, what what do you think? Well, I'm, when you're talking about being comfortable, mm. um, that is a really key key element of of being of, of rehabilitation and, and progress. Um, what do you mean? At, well, at the Adler Center. Um, By the most way, of describe our, it because uh, full disclosure, we're very close to the Adler, um, uh, the Adler Center, Fraser Mike Center, Mike and Lane. It's a community-based. Um, yep, sorry. great organization, mm -hmm. and and we've been part of it for a long time in terms of trying to help raise money. It's a not-for-profit, and they do great work. One of the only ones of its kind in the country. And Mike Adler, a very successful businessman, suffer dealt with has been dealing with aphasia for many years, and he and his wife, Elaine, started this wonderful mm -hmm. Adler Aphasia mm -hmm. Center, so that's how we know. Right. By the way, explain the connection. What is aphasia? What is a stroke? Same thing? Not? What is it? Um, well, as you had mentioned earlier, um, only a, approximately a third of yeah, people who endure a stroke, right. who have a stroke, um, end up with an, with an About aphasia. About a third? About a third. Um, that, the reason for that is that um, in order to have aphasia, the part of the brain that controls language and your ability to communicate is affected. What so is if it is that. Um, it is a language disorder um, as a result of damage to the language centers of the brain. Um, people with aphasia have difficulty not only in speaking but processing and understanding language as well as reading and writing the written forms. Uh, How do you help language. those who come to but the But their intellect aphasia. is intact. Their Say intelligence it again? their intelligence is intact. So it's not that different from it's a language barrier. Um, it's a language barrier. That notion of uh, being and waking up after the stroke or when you're first feeling the stroke, the, the feeling of I can't communicate with people because I have a language barrier, but I'm cognitively still in there okay. But that's one of the frustrations is that you know that what you're thinking and, and that you know that you can say that, but you can't say it. Mm -hmm. And you try to grab on the word that you need and the the word that you've been so u u usual to, you can't find it, um, and that's the frustration mm -hmm. because you know it, but you can't find it. We all have that tip of the tongue feeling once or twice here or there, but people with aphasia live it, wow, day in and day out, and they know they may live it for the remainder of their life to some degree. How aware do you think most Americans are of what a stroke is, how to deal with it? and what it's not. I, I would say, I think most people don't, don't really know the, the true impact of stroke on your life, <clears throat> how, um, how much it can change, even for someone who has um, what we will call a mild stroke. I mean, even that is, is, is so changing. There are so many things that you may not be able to do, um, whether it's aphasia, or if you have left-sided weakness, right-sided weakness, you can have visual deficits, you could have balance deficits. There's so many different things because it, it's based off of where in the brain the stroke happens, but the impact is pervasive. It costs, um, it causes people, it costs them a lot in terms of their life, in terms of what roles they used to play. Um, if you're a grandparent, if you now can't pick up your grandchildren or you have difficulty communicating, um, driving, just mm. being able to drive. If you live in the state of New Jersey, you know you really need to drive to get around, to get to the grocery store, to do certain things. So, um, But I don't think people have an idea, even just of what the warning signs are. Um, I think it was very fortunate that you recognized right away and that you called. But sometimes we have patients who come to us at Kessler and the story is very different. Well, I thought I, I had the worst headache, so I took a nap. So they waited. Right. Or did nothing. Well, they didn't know. Well, let's do this yeah. because what we're actually going to do is go we go on our website. It will be there, and I, I mean that, folks. So that's a message to our producers. Get it up there. Um, and also we'll tie you to the Adler Aphasia Center um, and also the Kessler Institute and, and, and our colleagues at Englewood. But let me ask you, go back, the warning signs, because you're, I believe you're saying why that some ignore them, or they went back to sleep, or they went to sleep. Or they didn't know. Or like, if you know. had a really bad headache, you might not associate <laughs> it with, and I'm not trying to panic people. Because people not have headaches the, all the time. Right, Correct. but it's, people describe it as the worst headache of their life. But maybe you don't want to go to sleep, 
you might want to stay awake and see, or I don't know, the doctor, the doctor would tell you better. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a couple different things right. that we're talking about. Um, but for ischemic stroke, for, you know, for the kind that Roberta suffered, there's an acronym that we use quite commonly, FAST, F-A-S-T. Mm -hmm. uh, F is for face. So people who have problems either with a facial droop, usually recognized by somebody else, either a facial droop or their words are coming out slurred or they, someone may say that they sound drunk or something like that or they're not able to speak at all. Uh, the A is for arm and also leg. So people who have either numbness or tingling or even just frank weakness in the arm or complete paralysis of the arm or leg. Uh, S is for speech. And then uh, T is for time. Uh, really, the last one is, mm -hmm. again, as you touched upon earlier, right. one of the most important things. So not only just recognizing that you're having a stroke or that you might be having a stroke, right. but also recognizing that time is of the utmost importance after you have a concern and that you have to seek treatment immediately. The word mini or the phrase uh, term mini stroke was used before. Mm -hmm. Such a thing? Uh, I think it's a generalized sort of term. Uh, what those usually are referred to are something called TIAs or transient ischemic attacks. TIAs. Mm -hmm. So right. some that may have stroke symptoms, which then resolve. Are those benign? I would say not, because those could be a harbinger of things to come. And to be honest with you, you don't know if those symptoms will resolve. So hold on a second. You don't know. Do you take an aspirin right away? I think that that would be probably not the best thing to do because... If you're concerned that you're mind having a stroke, a stroke may be from either a blockage in the blood vessel or it could also be from bleeding within the brain. And so if one were to take aspirin and there's bleeding in the brain, that might cause things to be worse. So yes, when we talk about, for instance, someone's having a heart attack, we're usually concerned that they have a blockage, you right. want to give them aspirin. For people who have ischemic strokes like Roberta, aspirin, you know, blood thinners are usually very good. But in the chance that there is a hemorrhage or bleeding within the brain, that could be... The difference between an aneurysm and a stroke is? An aneurysm is really a weakening in the wall of the blood vessel, and it kind of balloons out. It looks like almost like a, a blister, and those can rupture and cause the bleeding. In, in Real the quick, brain. before I go back to the rest of the panel, when is surgery appropriate when not? Uh, for aneurysms or for strokes? Like stand stroke for a second. For strokes? What, how, what do you do? It depends. When we talk about the kind of surgery that I do for right. strokes for the, in the acute setting, uh, we're talking about people that have a large blood vessel that's affected, relatively speaking, within the brain. None of the blood vessels are And there's a large. catheterization that goes on? It is. It's something very similar to, say, a heart catheterization that a lot of people have heard of. You know, their friends or family may have had some of that performed. Uh, we do go into the blood vessels and try to engage the clot that's blocking the blood vessel one way or the other and literally try to remove it or open it up or do something to get that blockage relieved. <sighs> Complex stuff. Log on to our site. I promise you we'll connect it to our partners here to get more information. Jeanette, help me on something. Talk about some of the specific techniques that you use. When I've seen some of them at the Adler Aphasia Center when we've gone on tours, and, um, and Elaine talks about it all the time, so I've learned a little bit. Yeah. Uh, well, um, most but talk about some of the specific techniques you use. Sure. Most, um, most folks with aphasia come to us um, after they've probably gone through uh, inpatient rehabilitation. So. so they could have been to, rest, to Kessler? Most likely. To, okay. to yeah. Because yeah. you, you guys are pretty good. <laughs> so uh, it's not an advertisement, they're not a sponsor, I just right. happen to know some great the people there. The typical scenario is that insurance has run out and or they've been told that their progress has slowed down to a point where they've con been considered to have plateaued. Um, and so they come to us saying, yeah, but I still have aphasia and I'm still not back to where I would like to be. So um, Mike and Elaine... Um, take great pride in the sense that we're, we're a social center. We feel, have a, feel more of a country club than we do a rehab clinic. So when our patients are now, we call them members, when they come to us, um, for many it's the first time they've met anybody else with this condition. So right away um, <coughs> there's a level of support and understanding and there's a barrier broken down immediately. Um, and then they, we also provide lots of stimulating therapy like uh, therapeutic programs Does that include some activities. of the plays I've seen? We have a drama club, we have um, computers, we have yes. a Skype group, an advocacy group. Family members come cooking. in. Yeah. And by the way, family is a big part of this, right? Let's family go. is a huge part. Yeah, and go back to, to your part of this. You're at Kessler. Family get involved or you want them out of the way? We want them there, day Talk one. About it. Um, well, because one, they know their family member best. If in the early stages they really can't communicate or there's difficulty with uh, motor skills, 
we want to find out what, what, who was that person before? How can we help them to get home? Our ultimate goal at Kessler is to try to get patients home and then they'll continue with the rehab process because we know that the three, four weeks you're going to have with us is just the beginning. Right. So, so we want the family there. We want them involved. We want to show them how they can help. Um, can they help? They can. How so? Because um, I'm coming to Roberto in a second and ask about that. So go ahead. I mean, one is as a support. One is definitely as a support and so that they understand because they're impacted just as much as the other as the other person. So they don't know what's going on either. They don't have an idea, unless you've been through it before, if they'll get better. How much will they get better? Um, do you think that she'll ever use her hand again? Do you ever think she'll walk? How can you help me? Um, so the family, we, ed we provide um, education programs. We have uh, Steps to Wellness, which is a stroke education program that we do for the families while they're there. Support we have, groups as well? We have a life. Um, it's called Life After Stroke, which is a support group for inpatient, but we also do one for outpatient. Okay. We also do an aphasia group for our outpatients who come in um, once a week or once a month they hold. Great. Because uh, I, I don't want to turn into a commercial. For no, 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 <laughs> That's okay. no, no, I know. But I just, I just want to get something uh, from a bird on this. Yes. And Mar was just talking about family and all those incredibly specific things you need from family. What did you need? Well, I needed not to allow myself to be isolated. I, it's easier to isolate yourself and not speak on the phone to your friends or see your family because it's difficult. It's difficult to speak to, speak to them. Um, don't, I don't necessarily want them to see what I'm going through. Why not? And, well, it's an emotional result of a person who is capable of doing a lot of other things. So it's easier to hide that and isolate yourself from um, being with your family and not being able to do some of the things you could do. Um, simple things like not being able to play Mahjong again or be with my friends <laughs> I again. I never could, go ahead. <laughs> or be with your friends again. Uh, it's easier not to join with them. Easier but not to. It's easier not to because it's, it's emotional. Uh, to, but you need to. But you need to. Because? And because the more you speak and the more you read and the more TV, television you watch, the more you're able to focus. And I found over the last six months that focusing was um, difficult at times. And I could have other things going on in my brain that aren't necessarily what I'm conversing with you. And I describe it as ping pong in my brain. And um, my, path my speech pathologist is now using that as a description for some of her patients because that's what goes on sometimes. Uh, although I'm focused, trying to be focused to you, right. uh, the clue is if I watch you and I, wa and I watch you speak, um, and I try to focus, I could still be having something else going on in my head. Well, for whatever it's worth, you're one of the best guests we've ever had on public television, <laughs> at least you. that I can remember. Dr. Jump in. when you listen to it, Roberta, is this, how much of the progress that someone makes is a product of their will to work hard? Uh, I think it's very much uh, directly related. Um, the more, as Roberto was saying, the more that one does, the more that one interacts, the more that one pushes themselves either by reading the newspaper, reading aloud, yes. reading to their, their spouse or their partner, and, you know, participating in group activities and whatnot, and not, not allowing the, um, the issues at hand limit them, but rather try to push their own sure. boundaries. You know, I think that then you will see that those people make tremendous strides in recovery in a relatively short period of time and, and continuously. So organizations like Kessler and like the Adler Aphasia Center, they're absolutely critical. You can do all the right things clinically, surgically, all the right things. But if these organizations are not in place, I mean, what do you do? Uh, this is, it's a very valid point. I mean, it is the point, actually. Without having institutions like these, there's no way that patients that have neurological injuries of any kind, really, for instance, or not even just neurological injuries, just injuries in general, right. um, they won't be able to, like I said, push those boundaries right. and really stretch their mind, their bodies, whatever it is that that's, that's being, has an ailment and to recover. 
Well, I'll tell you, all of you have done a tremendous public service, and uh, I just want to particularly thank you, Roberta, thank you. for sharing with us and offering uh, so much insight. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 20 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Inglewood Hospital and Medical Center, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, and New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey, and the Star Ledger and NJ.com, everything Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Don't miss Steve Adubato and co-host Raphael P. Ramon each week on New Jersey Capital Report. Airing on NJTV 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings. The value of New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company has come from our experienced, dedicated team for almost a century. Auto and homeowners insurance for employees of New Jersey Business and Industry Association members. Deposit accounts and loans for the general public through NJM Bank. We're here to work for the interests of our customers, not stockholders. More about a unique kind of relationship is at NJM.com. NJM, where experience pays dividends.